This particular lecture is going to be a follow-up to our classroom discussion and uh, lecture on uh, 18th century fiction. Here we are taking Charlotte Temple and discussing its themes and techniques. I'm going to follow this obviously with an online discussion. I'll post a couple of threads for you to contribute to and there'll be a, a quiz online. It will not be in this video, uh, but I will send you out in the discussion materials a quiz or the announcement for the discussion materials a quiz. This particular lecture is going to focus on the themes and a little bit on the narrative technique of uh, uh, Susanna Rosen. Uh, in particular, we're going to be focusing on three different themes that emerge in the book. Again, we, we're going back to the uh, issue of uh, what type of fiction this is. It's pop fiction, if you want to call it that. It's Some people would call it pulp fiction or, or you know, um, dime store uh, novels, that kind of stuff. Um, it's not intended to be very, very serious fiction. Even Rosen herself sort of makes a bow at that and says, look, this is for popular consumption. It's not supposed to be something high and mighty. The novel itself, as we said in class, isn't considered to be a genre of great repute. But the themes are interesting, and when we explore it, it tells us something about the era. It tells, it tells us something about the circumstances that young women found themselves in, and it also tells us about what an author, in this case Rosen, might feel compelled to comment on or to expand on uh, in order to uh, make some sort of mark on society's expectations regarding young women. Uh, we're going to talk about marriage and what Rosen seems to be offering, which is some sort of handbook on how to navigate the social expectations around marriage. And then we're going to talk about the theme of prudence, and it's a little bit more complex than that. Prudence, benevolence, those kinds of things, uh, sentiment. Uh, and then the duty and, and prescribed roles for young women, because this is, if anything, it's a novel about trying to get through life as a young woman um, while still having a... A, you know, a, a sense of social respectability, um, being able to fulfill your duties, uh, but at the same time there seems to be at least some voice in here on Rosen's part to talk about um, you know, how to achieve some sense of happiness and self-determination in, in life. Uh, we'll start off with marriage, and mostly I'm going to be asking questions here, and in our discussion I'll ask you to explore those questions because I don't have the answers on this. I mean, I've read this novel many times, and it's a very famous novel, even though it's not considered great literature. It's interesting literature because it's a little bit ambiguous. What message is Rosen sending girls about marriage, and how can this be seen sort of as an advice book. Um, there are people who argue about this all the time and say Rosen is really just reinforcing the old norms about marriage and the fact that, that young women are uh, oppressed, they're brought up in a patriarchal society where they're not given choices, they're treated as property, etc., etc. And she's just really basically saying be a good girl and, and, and do as you're told. Others see something else in the novel and see uh, a sort of um, you know, subtle criticism, sometimes not so subtle criticism, of the institution of marriage, at least as it's practiced, not necessarily as Rosen would, would want it to be. Um, and that's going to come up again. We're going to read Margaret Fuller. Margaret Fuller in the 19th century is going to have an awful lot to say about marriage and how important it is to take another look at it as an institution. That by the 19th century, uh, there were a lot of voices that were saying, this isn't working for women. This is not working. The way marriage was sort of structured throughout earlier human history, we've outgrown it. We've, we, we need to move beyond it. So I don't want to put this out there as Rosen being some sort of radical when it comes to marriage, but I do want to at least open up the door of the possibility that maybe she's questioning certain aspects of how it's being practiced or viewed. There really is... The novel, at the very least, you have to admit this, no matter which side of that debate you're on, you have to admit that the novel really presents us with a clash of dominant views about marriage. There were about four, that I can see, dominant views um, of marriage in the 18th century and throughout history, honestly. Um, the first is a religious view of marriage, and that is that 
you are supposed to have a mate because it is very important for your spiritual development um, to, you know, Adam and Eve and, um, you know, uh, becoming one flesh. And there are a lot of biblical arguments for marriage, a lot of biblical arguments about or, 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 or you know, guidelines for how one should conduct oneself within a marriage. Um, and that's not just about fidelity, but about love and affection and those kinds of things. And, and there are a lot of biblical laws um, that, in the Judeo-Christian tradition anyway, that inform the Western view of marriage. There are a lot of things about the Western view of marriage that aren't the least bit biblical, that are really more traditional and kind of predate Christianity in the West. But there's always been a sort of religious view out there that one can take and that many do take about, about marriage. The second view um, is that, you know, is, is marriage as an economic institution. We talked a little bit about that in class and about Benjamin Franklin and his wife and how many people saw it kind of as a business transaction, you know, a merger of two businesses in a way, uh, a partnership in the, in the business sense of that a corporate uh, entity. Um, you do your job, I do mine, I make money, you run the household, da-da-da-da-da, division of labor, that sort of thing. There's, there's very much that view. And I'm not saying that these views are antithetical to one another. They're frequently, you know, a, a couple or a community could see all of these views as having relevance. I'm just saying that the, there are four ways that people tended to view marriage. The third, of course, is biological. You need to have m marriages so that we can have babies and families and things like that. And that's always been a very high priority for every civilization is that you, procreation is very important. And um, many people even go so far as to say that the primary um, reason for marriage is children. Um, uh, I, I, you know, that's been accepted by some people in the West and not always by everybody. There, most people, I think, probably see it as something more than just, you know, an, a, you know, an institution that's designed to create reproduction. Uh, but there is that important component. And the fourth one is happiness, contentment. Um, uh, one might even say joy, um, and and I and I kind of downplayed that in 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 the uh, in the class portion of this by saying, look, that that we have a very very heightened view of how important happiness, contentment, satisfaction, love, romance, all those things are. I don't want to say that in the 18th century people did not have that view. What I want to say though is that it's not it, they didn't view it the same way we do. We we almost put number four as the first and, and foremost of all of those things, that the most important thing about marriage is for, for the people being married to be happy and, and in bliss and in love and, and, and romantic. And that's just not the way marriage has always been seen. Our generation tends to see it that way. But that is, don't, don't, don't assume that because we see marriage that way that, it, that others have always seen it that way. There's a very different, there's different ways to look at it. Um, and and you see this clash of these dominant views. That's what the novel is about. The novel is not about laying out these dominant views. The novel is about the clash of these dominant views, that, that some of them are bumping into one another, particularly number four and number two. Those are the really big ones that tend to, to, to bump into each other and butt heads in the novel. We see this with, uh, as I've referred to in, in, in class, the uh, admonition that Mr. Temple gives to uh, Mr. Temple's father, I should say, gives to Mr. Temple about marrying Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Wither Weatherby. He says on page 52 of my text anyway, Then prithee, my dear lad, said uh, his father, since your rank and fortune are so much beneath that uh, what your princess might expect. He kind of calls his fiance his princess. Um, uh, be so kind as to turn your eyes on Miss Weatherby, who having only an estate of 3,000 a year is more upon a level with you and your and whose father yesterday solicited the mighty honor of your alliance. Let me pause for a minute. 3,000 per year. He's talking about 3,000 pounds. Now, you might say, well, pounds, that's what the British use for. Yes, that's right. That's the British currency, the British pound. Where, where did the world word pound get its name? Well, it means pound sterling or a pound of sterling silver. There are 16 ounces in a pound, and if you assume that, a, that, that an ounce of silver today is worth a little bit less than $20, one pound of sterling silver in today's valuation is something along the line of you know, 300 and something dollars. 3,000 uh, pounds of silver uh, it, it just today would be a substantial 
sum of money. Okay, 3,000 times 300 is about $900,000 a year, this woman, in today's money. So when he says 3,000 a year, he says, look, the, the, this girl has a dowry of a million bucks a year. This is no, this is no uh, pauper we're talking about. He says, I shall leave you to consider on this offer and pray, remember that your union with Miss Weatherby will put it in your power to be more liberally the friend of Lucy Eldridge. That's a really smarmy sort of thing. What he's basically telling his son is, Look, marry for money. It doesn't really matter whether you like her or not. You can always, uh, you know, fool around with your mistress, and then you can take your, the money of this one woman and give it to your mistress and, and treat her really well. That's a really awful thing. Again, parents don't come off very well in the novel. That's for sure. But more importantly, this hypocrisy. You have to ask yourself, well, what's causing this? What's causing this? I think is that is Rosen is, is saying anyway. What's causing this is that marriage is out of kilter. Marriage as an institution is out of whack. It's it's all wrong. It's skewed. And, and we're using marriage for something, namely economic advancement, that it wasn't designed to be used for. We've taken that economic uh, view and we've distorted it. We've, we've, we've bloated it up and made it the most important thing. And that's not appropriate. That's not what you should do. It shouldn't exist for that reason. But marriage as an institution has become that among certain classes because of greed, because of sin, because of whatever. And, um, and, and this is the problem when it becomes that way. So the current state of the institution of marriage in, as Rosen's presenting it, encourages adultery is what she seems to be arguing here. You see this a little bit with Montreville's father on page 74 of my text as well. Um, the... Um, uh, we, we see Montreville is trying to encourage, uh, or his dad is, is, is even more stern, and he says, um, If indeed a woman whose fortune is sufficient to preserve you in the state of independence I would teach you to prize should generously bestow herself on a young soldier whose chief hope of future prosperity depended on his success in the field, if such a woman should offer, every barrier is removed, and I should rejoice in a union which would promise so much felicity. His father knows that military officers of, of Montreville's rank they don't make a lot of money. They're going to have to either really distinguish themselves and excel in their career and one day make a lot of money as an upper officer, right, a general of some sort or a colonel, or they're going to have to find some other line of work, or they're going to have to find some woman who's got a lot of money to marry. If you were an officer like Montreville, you had a commission, an officer. It had a certain amount of respectability, but it didn't pay you much, right? Um, and so as a result, if you wanted to advance in life, it's nice that you're an officer, but you're going to have to find a way to make some money too, pal. And what he says, but mark me, boy, if on the contrary, you rush into a precipitate union with a girl of little or no fortune, take the poor creature from a comfortable home and kind friends and plunge her into all the evils a narrow income, meaning your low income, an increasing family can inflict, I will leave you to enjoy the blessed fruit of your rashness. For all, for by all that is sacred, neither my interest or, for, or fortune shall ever be exerted in your favor. I am serious, end quote. In other words, if you don't heed what I tell you, if you marry a poor girl just because you fall in love with her, I will not support you. You will get not one penny from me, boy. You better marry right, and you better marry for money because you don't have any, and I don't have much to squander on on some engagement where you're not going to have some money, and you have to keep coming to me all the time for it. That's a really hard nose. Parents, again, do not come off well in this. Moreover, um, we also see on page 102, on the flip side with Charlotte herself, um, we see how bad it can be if you break the rules, right? If you violate the rules, it's rough, not just on the guys, but it's really rough on the women. Um, the narrator takes a moment, time out here, and wants the reader to really reflect. There's a, there's, a, there's a risk she's running in offering Charlotte to you as the major character. The risk is if you see her behavior as being unacceptable, as being sinful, as being wicked, as being adulterous, as being, you know, horrible and, and she's sexually loose and all that kind of thing. You, as the young reader, who's probably very chaste and very good and very innocent and very naive, you're not going to like her. You're going to think, ooh, she's a wicked girl. I don't, I, I can't identify with that character. So as the narrator, 
um, in, in, in the, and the narrator in, in Rosen's novel has to come out, the voice has to come out and say, wait a minute, time out, before you judge, have a little sympathy. Because she's she's worried by about page 102, a little past the halfway mark, that she may be losing the reader's sympathies, right? So she stops and she says, <clears throat> and she kind of reflects for a moment and asks you to reflect on what it must be like to be the girl who got used and jilted. She says, the wife whose breast glows with affection to her husband and who in return meets only indifference can but faintly conceive her anguish, the mistress, somebody who's a mistress. In other words, the wife who goes home, whose husband comes home every day and her husband doesn't love her anymore, even she has it better than a mistress. And here's why. Dreadfully painful is the situation of such a woman, but she has many comforts of which our poor Charlotte was deprived. The duteous, faithful wife, though treated with indifference, right, even if your husband doesn't love you anymore, has one solid pleasure within her own bosom. She can reflect that she has not deserved neglect, that she has ever fulfilled the duties of her station with the strictest exactness. She may hope by constant, constant assiduity and unremitted attention to recall her wanderer and be doubly happy in his returning affection. In other words, she, you, you have, at least if you're a respectable woman in a loveless marriage, at least you know in your heart that you're doing your duty, that you didn't neglect your duty, that you were a good wife to your husband. And even if he's not been a husband who's been faithful or, or kind to you, or maybe he'll come back. You at least have that hope that maybe he'll come back and, 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 and fall in love with you again. Um, she knows she cannot leave her. He cannot leave her to unite himself to another, right? He, divorce was not a possibility back in the day. He can't go. You always have him. It's just whether you can rekindle that love. He cannot cast her out to poverty and contempt. She's a married woman. She has respectability by virtue of her status as a married woman. He can't do that to you. <clears throat> she looks around her and sees the smile of friendly welcome or the tear of affectionate consolation on the face of every person whom she favors with her esteem. And from all these circumstances, she gathers comfort. But the poor girl, by, circum by thoughtless passion led astray, Charlotte, the poor girl who goes and gets pregnant before being married, um, who in parting with her honor, read that as you wish, has forfeited the esteem of every man to whom she has sacrificed everything dear and valuable in life, feels his indifference in the fruit of her own folly and laments her want of power to recall his lost affection. She knows there is no tie but honor and that in a man who has been guilty of seduction is but very feeble. He may leave her in a moment to shame and want. He may marry and forsake her forever. And should, should he, she has no, and should he, she has no redress, no friendly, soothing companion to pour into her wounded mind the balm of consolation, no benevolent hand to lead her back to the path of rectitude. She has disgraced her friends, forfeited the good opinion of the world, and undone herself. She feels herself a poor, solitary being in the midst of surrounding multitudes. Shame bows her to the earth. Remorse tears her distracted mind and guilt. Poverty and disease close the dreadful scene. She sinks unnoticed to oblivion. Holy cow, that's bleak, isn't it? Wow. If you it, it, before you think that that Rosen is only being tongue in cheek about her sort of preachiness about how you know how young women ought to be careful, um, you re, that's a that's a lengthy passage and an interesting one where she really lays it on and says, "Listen here, girl." You got to be really careful out there. You have to be careful because the consequences of 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 making a big mistake, death, nothing less than death and shame and absolute isolation. Um, so 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 we're given young men who are being pulled in two directions, young women who are being pulled in two directions, and that's the crux of what makes the novel very interesting is not that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's about seedy sorts of topics. It's about the fact that there is something underlying this sort of pop fiction, you know, sexy, whatever you want to call it, that is somewhat serious. In the next couple of slides, we'll explore a little bit further those additional themes and the narrative technique.